great to sit down and, and have a chat with you. I mean, I appreciate that it's the tail end of a week <laughs> and you've given up the last slot to, to us. So uh, really, really pleased to have you on, Kev. Um, we're just going to kind of start, I think, by um, hearing a little bit about you and what it is you do. And then I've got some questions you can tell. I'm sure you're going to tell us some stories uh, and then we'll see where it goes. No, no pressure. Eh? No, no pressure. I'm sure you're going to tell us some stories. It's like, <laughs> wow, I had no idea. I've got one word answers prepared for everything, Alison. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I, I've i suffered with a thing called labelitis all my life, right? So when someone asks me the question, you know, what, what are you? How do you describe yourself? That can be quite a challenge. But I've nailed it recently. Um, so if anyone asks me now what it is that I do, it's... Um, I'm a professional storyteller, you know, that's it. And it's it's probably never been never been more obvious and more and more easy because I create stories uh, and I get paid to create stories. Ergo, I am a professional storyteller. So it's almost like it's the Ron Seal version of uh, of kind of naming what I do. But what I what I do now and what I kind of focus on is helping businesses to tell their uh, client stories, so their their case studies, and also help charities to to tell their impact stories. Um, so it's really just about trying to help you know businesses and charities to to get out of what I call stealth mode and really show how good they are, uh, and and do that by sharing the stories of the people they help. Um, that that's the that's the main focus of, of the business now, which is absolutely being the story writer. But I also uh, work with people to help them upskill themselves to to become confident storytellers themselves as well. Yeah, that's really fab. And does that does it feel weird to call yourself a storyteller? Because you know the connotation of that, isn't it? That you know there's something not very good about being a storyteller. So that you know, how does that feel? It's it's funny because that's part of where the label like this thing has come from, right? So I I have uh, called myself since starting this business. I've been an outsourced marketing director. I've been a marketing consultant. I've been a marketing advisor, a storytelling coach, a storytelling consultant, a storytelling advisor. Uh, uh, you know, I, I I thankfully have never been a storytelling ninja. Uh, or a storytelling guru uh, or, or an expert. I've never called myself any of those things. Um, but I, I think I, I have always kind of struggled a little bit because people have different connotations of what you what you mean by um, storyteller. Uh, so so for so for me, it's quite liberating now. You know, it's dead easy to say I'm, I'm a professional storyteller, and that normally, you know, if someone knows what that means, that's fine. If they don't, it'll lead to a follow-up question where I can say, "This is what I do. I, you know, I, I write case studies. Um, you know, I write impact stories, and I, and I help people get the attention they deserve. You know, it's 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 a lot more natural. And I think you'll you'll know it from your experience as a marketer that uh, you know sometimes um, we can try too hard and to to be a little bit too clever about you know how we how we describe ourselves and. I think storytelling is one of these ones where uh, it is what it is. And I've had a few people say to me, you know, um, you shouldn't call yourself a storyteller. You know, you should you should change the the approach. And actually, a, a New York Times bestselling author actually gave me that advice and said, no one really cares about storytelling. Um, that's not what keeps them awake at night. That's that's not the, um, you know, so I, I, I can see the point he was making, you know, you know, businesses might be buying case studies, but they don't necessarily connect that with being a story. Um, so I think, uh, you know, for me, it's always been um, a bit of a mental challenge. But now the way that I look at it, and it's really, I, as I say, liberating, is I'm not looking to convince anybody about storytelling. What I'm looking to do is work with people that are already convinced that storytelling has a part to play in what they do. That's who I'm looking at find. That's who I'm looking to spend my time with. I don't want to spend my time, you know, really doing the heavy sell. Because if I have to do the heavy sell, the chances are they don't really deeply believe that storytelling can help how they communicate. Yeah. And of course, there's a whole centre dedicated to storytelling in Edinburgh. So, yeah. you know, it can't all be a bad thing, can it? <laughs> no, I think, I think listen, we are, we're storytelling animals. You know, it's what we, 
it's what we do, you know, it's how we communicate. It's the most natural thing. And I, I consider myself genuinely really, really lucky to, to be able to say that, you know, I, I, I tell stories for a living. So, uh, yeah, very lucky. And what's the best thing about what you do? This. So the best thing about the best thing about what I do is this is having a conversation with, a, with another human being. Um, you know, I, you know, people sometimes maybe don't quite get what a storyteller does or a case study writer does. Um, but a huge part of it is interviewing somebody is is sitting, you know, especially right now, calls like this where I will um, I will ask questions that get to the heart of the story. Um, so that unquestionably the most enjoyable aspect is having the conversation, asking questions, really listening. That, that's the most important skill of a, of a storyteller is to listen, because I might have a set of questions that I have planned to, to share with somebody. But for me, it's all about listening so that I can pick up on something and then ask a follow up question. And sometimes the real value of the story, the heart of the story, actually comes from these follow-up questions. And, and and again, I don't, you know, because my stories aren't tell me why you love this company. It's it's their story. It's about it's about their experience. So a, a lot of times I have to kind of tee it up a little bit because they're expecting it to be more like a traditional case study rather than a human-centered story. So um, yeah definitely for me the best part is just having that conversation getting to understand them getting to know them and then going away and then you know finding what's the heart of the story and then writing it fab okay uh, i mean this this series that um we are producing which is kind of a, a spotlight on a on a member and a business in our local area is obviously to help us at dundee and angus chamber showcase what our members do and and you know what's so amazing about our local businesses and and yeah. the community and the proud community that we're at the heart of so yeah. I'm interested in 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 all sorts of different things but one of the questions I had was what's your favorite thing about Dundee and Angus yeah I mean it's it's a it's a great it's a great question I think uh, for me there's there's a couple of perspectives on you know that question and and you know one is business and, and one is one is personal you know business you know, I I love the the diversity of, of businesses in uh, in the city. I love the resilience of of this city uh, that has had so many you know uh, tough knocks over the years and has has managed to you know kind of rise above that and and reinvent itself. Not just once. I'm not just talking about the DNA effect, but continually has been able to kind of reinvent itself and, and and I you know I'm a proud Dundonian you know I was born in Dundee I, I did emigrate to uh, Insture uh, in Perthshire you know uh, I but I'm still a proud Dundonian um you know and my, my family's from uh, from Angus you know so my you know my, my parents um were from Kerry Muir and you know my wife's from Kerry Muir and all her family are still there so so I think on a personal level what I love about Dundee and Angus is, you know, it's just the place, is the fact that, you know, you can be in a busy city one minute and the next second you're out in the most beautiful scenery. Um, you know, we, we are we are truly bre uh, blessed with a, a really stunning landscape mm -hmm. um, all around us, you know. And, and I, I, you know, for me, where I stay in Insture, you know, Karsagawi is a beautiful part of the world, but you know, another half an hour away and you can have a completely different um, uh, kind of landscape in front of you. And, and yeah, I think I think we're, we're, we're really, really lucky where we are, definitely. Um, and then, I mean, another question that I'm just, we're, we're always, I'm always interested in, in kind of what, what different things appeal to different people. So our next question is really about, like, what's your favourite time of the year and why? Yeah, I, I see, I, that's, that's a, uh, that's another good question, and again, you know, you, you kind of go, all oh, right, and it's questions that you're not used to to being um, asked sometimes. You know, so for for me, uh, initially, I was thinking, you know, I quite like you know this time of year, you know, like quite like when the lighter nights. But the bottom line is, you know, for me, it's Christmas, right? I love Christmas. Now, I, I it's not for particular religious reasons. Um, it's not even for the the big fella with a, a whiter beard than than me. Um, 
<laughs> it's probably for me. It's the, it's the only time of the year where I take a, a an extended break from the business. Um, so I will typically try and mirror the the holidays that the kids have got. Um, <laughs> you know, so so that means I'm I'm off for anywhere between you know two two to three weeks and I don't really do that during during the rest of the year I don't have the luxury of that so it is really really nice to to be able to spend time with the with the kids with Jill with um you know family and friends catching up but also just unwinding just switching off just relaxing um you know and I think for the last couple of years I've been able to kind of reflect on you know use that time to reflect on just what I've achieved what I've done and 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 actually for for the you know certainly for the first time sometimes just remind myself I've actually done all right you know uh, and I think as you'll appreciate you know sometimes when you're in the middle uh you you know of things and you're working hard and you're, you're thinking about where's the next um opportunity coming from and trying to spin all the plates and oh, I've got my accounts due on oh, no, I need to do that and all the things that you don't get the opportunity to truly switch off. So for me, it is just a really blissful thing to go, you know what, uh, Netflix, uh, you know, uh, books, um, maybe a little bit of writing of my own uh, for fun, uh, some board games with the kids, uh, maybe a few small libations, one or two. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, that, that for me is, is the, it's the perfect time of year. It's a nice time of year when the expectations of clients dampens down too, isn't it? So, you know, just naturally everybody's taking a bit of a break and, and you do get a chance to re-watch The Sound of Music over and over <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you know what? I think the first time I really did it properly was actually to do with my, my client that I worked with in Australia because the way that most businesses work in Australia because, you know, the, the Christmas holidays is the height of their summer, they they tend to have a lot of industries tend to have like a, 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 a you know a switch off and they, they close down for like three weeks a month sometimes so so I was working really intensely with my Australian client and they said oh by the way we're you know we we're coming off at this time and I was like well that's great you know that that means I can do the same because like you said the expectations aren't going to be there it's not going to be that you're going to be reacting to your email as soon as something comes in so so yeah yeah for for me it started off with that but it's now become a little bit of a a little bit of a tradition you know that's my time in fact you know what I, you know what I did today I actually went to my, my calendar and, and blocked off um that the, the kind of two weeks before Christmas and the few days after it so nice isn't it just yeah. that I mean it's 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 funny isn't it we're starting to talk about Christmas but I'm um, I mean we're recording this it's the sort of the first week in June it's been the weirdest um second quarter of the year hasn't it but Absolutely. um What's the thing that you're missing most during lockdown? Um, hugs. Hugs. I am a semi-professional hugger. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I have. I was going to say I have a reputation, but that 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 <laughs> doesn't sound like the best thing. But no, I I, I, I am. I, I'm a, a tactile person. I am a. I am a hugger. Um, and uh, you know, for for me. It's that kind of thing, you know. My mum and dad were, were in the back garden last week, um, having having drinks, socially distanced, being obviously very, very sensible. And um, but I just miss giving them a hug because mm -hmm. every time I see them, you know, you know, I give them a hug. I'm, I, you know, it's just it's part of my DNA, I think. So, um, you know, to to the to the uh, to the effect that you know, there, there's a few people I know who who just hate getting hugged, and and you know, I go out of my way to hug them, and you can you know. That you can almost feel their spine melt as soon as there's any hugging contact. They just they, they want no part of it. Um, so I, th I think that's probably the, the the biggest thing I've missed is is just that that human contact, that high fives with mates. The uh, you know just just the 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 simple you know the simple things. But uh, you know I have to say I feel quite lucky in that while a lot of people are really suffering um, with their, their mental health right now through through this whole period. I'm actually feeling better than I felt in a long time. So, uh, you know, I, I I feel really, really fortunate that I've, I've come through this better than, than a lot of people right now, definitely. Yeah, I think, I mean, I've heard a lot of people say the, say something similar. It, it's given us the chance to slow down a little bit. Um, it has given us, I mean, it, 
although we're quite busy, aren't we, when, when yeah. there's lots of Zoom calls and, and other things going on, but, you know, the morning commute is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, so, I mean... I, I mean, it coincides, the whole lockdown period coincides with me figuring out an awful lot of things about uh, myself and, and the business and, and you know, it helped me really kind of hone in on, you know, what is it I want to be, the, what, what, what do I want the, the business to become and, and what is it I want to do? And I think it's actually having that bit of breathing space, you know, uh, I, and giving your, yourself permission to not be putting pressure on yourself you know my my first responsibility is, is is the kids right now you know my wife's a nurse Jill's a nurse so um you know during the day you know my my first responsibility is to make sure the kids have got the support they need um and that's really helping me kind of prioritize and manage the kind of you know what can I realistically expect to do in a in a in a business day and and just reframing that has, has really really helped and and I think, yeah, for, for me, when I, you know, in, in five years' time, when we look back on this this whole experience, it'll, it'll, it'll have played, for me, a pivotal role in shaping the direction of, of where I'm going with the business, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people are finding all, all sorts of different ways to rejig what they do and how they do it, aren't they? And, and yeah. you know, people in, in our team are, are just being amazing in how they're coping with it but I, I genuinely feel for people that do have children at home that are still trying to do their day job around family commitments and and not only that but it helped their their young people through education yeah. and yeah. and even just coping with what we're we're going through is just so difficult for young people isn't it yeah it, yeah it, it, it absolutely is and and I you know I, I've got friends who's whose kids have really struggled through this whole process and, and they aren't coping well. And, and, I, and I, again, I consider myself really lucky that, that you know, our kids, uh, you know, like I've got a 10-year-old, uh, uh, you know, uh, a 14-year-old and a, and a 15-year-old. Um, mm-hmm. The 15, 15-year-old will be 16 at the end of this month. Um, so they're all at different stages. Um, you know, the youngest one, you know, needs a little bit more support with kind of schoolwork. Um, you know, the, the eldest is, is, you know, is just getting on and doing it. And, and the middle middle child needs a bit more kind of, um, you know, reminder that he uh, that he should be doing some work. Um, so it, it is a challenge. But I think the first and most important thing is that their well-being is, is uh, you know, is, is top trumps across everything else. You know, that as long as they are, as long as they are happy and they, and they have been. I mean, it, it's been hard, but I certainly think there's been more laughter in this house than than there has been in probably quite a long time. So it's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah. I'm enjoying definitely spending more time with the people at home that you just yeah. are, are often a, a bit busy to kind of... Yeah do to spend that time and yeah. um I mean those of you that know me will know that you know an hour's exercise was never really on my radar <laughs> certainly not every single day until yeah. all of a sudden we got told we could go out and have an hour's yeah. exercise and and stuff so yeah I've certainly been doing an awful lot more kind of um you know dragging my husband out for an hour's walk or or you know going or he it's more likely him going right okay it's kind of time are you stopping shall we go out and <laughs> kind of <laughs> spend a bit of time it's nice and and we've gone we've you know even just on our doorstep found all sorts of different places yeah. that you know we've never bothered to walk anywhere yeah. near um you know cared park's not far from us and before the golfers were back on it we were spending you know quite a bit of time wandering yeah. through there it's absolutely stunning so yeah. Yeah, I have really enjoyed that side of it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, you know, first of all, I, I thought it was a, an hour exercise across the whole of lockdown. So uh, I, I've, been, I've been doing 12 seconds of a walk every day. So I, I, I'm going to have to readjust my readjust my plans. Um, but no, I, in, all, in all seriousness, going, going out for a, for a walk, it's, it's quite interesting. Normally the walk would be kind of me with the kids and Jill will have been on her feet all day as a nurse and, and just want to kind of relax and chill out a bit but she started coming for a walk and sometimes sometimes the kids are there and sometimes it's just uh, uh, you know it's just me and Jill going for a walk and it's just really nice just to go out get a bit of fresh air and, and actually have a chat without the distractions of devices television and occasionally children so <laughs> uh, um, so yeah no it, it, it is it is nice and, and I think you know I, I certainly 
I certainly have, have put on the, the weight. I mean, much of that is from the the the, the, the beard. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I've definitely put on weight, and I've, I've been cooking a lot more as well through through this and really enjoying it. Um, I don't know if my family have been, but I, I've been enjoying it. Um, but yeah, you know, you know, for for me, uh, I, I I think I've been able to cope better with the with this than. I think a lot of people that I know, uh, and I think I'm quite a home bird anyway, so I quite like, I quite like uh, being being where I am, and and yeah, you know, it, it, the longer it goes on, the harder it gets for some people. But again, for me, I, I consider myself lucky that I've been able to to mentally and emotionally cope with it. I mean, you've talked quite a lot about how your work, you know, you've had a chance to have a have a think, and and you know, you're kind of maybe kind of changing some of what you're doing but what does the future hold then for you yeah i, I think the you know la, over the last few years the the focus of the business has been on on teaching people you know so uh, you know I, I it's very much been i want to you know give people the ability to go and tell their stories for themselves and uh, you know i i i love the the teaching side of things um it's it's hard um you know it's it's challenging it's particularly challenging where i've had a few bigger ones where a lot of people in the room haven't wanted to be there like they don't buy into it so it's really hard to kind of get any engagement from some people who, who just you know are quite entrenched um and that can be quite a challenge but there's also an awful lot of mental energy that gets expended when you're doing you know workshop after workshop or, or training after training and um so you know I, I certainly for me when when lockdown when it became clear we were going into lockdown i had seven things booked and five and um all seven of them were workshops right so i was like oh oh dear and um, so there was a little bit of i would say fatalism like it was mm-hmm. uh were doomed um you know there was a little bit of uh, a little bit of panic but that that only lasted for literally an hour right I, I had an hour of kind of allowing myself to go right oh, this isn't good this isn't good uh, and then as during that hour four people came back to me to say just to confirm we're definitely not going to go ahead with this workshop we need to we need to we'll, we'll rearrange when when the world is normal again um so uh, so I, I was left with you know a pipeline of work just gone and uh, you know that that was scary um but i i was very and, and you know I, people get me in trouble for using phrases like lucky uh it's usually when i say i'm lucky it's followed by you make your own luck and, and all that the kind of cliches and, and it's true to a certain extent but um my my biggest ever client landed um just at the at the start of of this whole uh, lockdown situation so someone that saw me appear on a webinar um you know late last year got in touch to say that he wanted me to help um his business to to well, not his business he's the head of, of marketing for a, a mia for a, a large technology company and you know it was one of those ones that it seemed like too good to be true and and he kept on coming back saying we're definitely going to do it but not just yet not just yet and i'm like that's fine that's okay and i'd mentally kind of written it off uh and then it came off and uh, and this was instead of teaching this was you know writing stories and i've now written uh five stories for for this one client um with another five in the pipeline and i've also written another story recently for a for a charity uh through in perth and, and what that's kind of taught me is that you know first and foremostly my 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 real passion and you know i'm not meaning to be humble here but I am a better writer of stories than I am a story teacher. You know, uh, I, I I can teach people to tell stories, but I, I believe my my real strength and my real ability is to is to ask questions, listen to the answers, and create a really compelling story. That's that's the the focus for the future of this business. That 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 is the that is a hundred percent. You know, and it's it's only taken me you know kind of forty five years of my life to figure out what the hell I want to be when I when I grow up. Um, but you know, for me, being the storyteller is where I want to be. Now, I'll still help people and I'll still do workshops, but the preference and and the focus is is to is to secure more work where I I work with people you know longer term to help them not just tell one story but tell the stories of the people that they help and they support. So, having that clarity of of purpose, um, you know, I don't think I would have got that clarity 
if it hadn't been for this whole uh, mm. lockdown situation. I don't think I would have had the headspace to, to, to think clearly and rationally. So for me, uh, yeah, the future of the business is, is you know, probably 90, 90% of my time, you know, writing stories and the rest of the time kind of teaching people to, to do it for themselves. Um, you know, that's that's where I want to be. Um, that's where I get the the biggest set, sense of, you know, satisfaction, you know, being able to actually have have an outcome, you know, here's <laughs> something that is that is now out in the world that people are using uh, and you know that that is i just want more of that you know an, an ideal day for me is getting up in the morning and um, having my cup of tea and uh, and then starting writing the starting you know start writing a story that's it great uh, so you I mean you were talking about you know getting out and about so when we are getting out of lockdown uh, is there some place that's on your lockdown escape bucket list yeah, I, I think there's uh, I think there's two things. There's there's two there's two places. One, it's a really long journey for me. It's it's um, thanks to Google Maps, I know exactly how long the journey is. It's point four of a mile. Um, so I, I will uh, I will go to the Insture Hotel. Um, so uh, the Insture Hotel is kind of the you know there's lots of kind of hearts of the the local community, but Insure Hotel is absolutely one of them for me. I have client meetings there i have family meals there birthday meals there um you know uh, coffee and catch up with friends sometimes beer catch up alcohol based catch up with friends um so i i can't wait to go uh, to go back there I, I know some people are like wow you know i was thinking barbados or something really exciting and, <laughs> and you and you're going to the bloody institute hotel um you, it, you know i'm a man i'm a simple man of simple uh, simple tastes and pleasure so yeah, it'll be nice because that's you know back to the, the the seeing people and meeting people. That that's that's probably the thing that I that I've, I've missed. And and there's an awful lot of nice people in this community, and it'd be nice to catch up again. If I'm thinking kind of further afield, and it sounds a little bit cheesy, it's less a a, a, a kind of place uh, and more the the people. So every every year um my family so so me jill and the, the three boys and both sets of grandparents we, we go away somewhere together you know so normally you know up north uh we'll, you know or, or sometimes um we'll go to the north of um, england as well and we'll just rent a house you know a big, a big enough house somewhere and uh we'll have a week away where we just have the best time ever you know we we are, we're really lucky it's weird. Um, it's a little bit kind of like Waltons, you know. Everyone, you know, everyone loves each other. It's sickening. It really is. Um, but you know, Jill's Jill's mum and dad and my mum and dad were at the same school together in Kerry. So, so when I came home from having my first date with Jill, you know, my mum and dad were like, "Oh, we we know, we know that, you know, we know them." I was like, "Oh my god." How awkward. Um, but um, what that means is that they're, they're like really good friends. My mum and dad and Jill's mum and dad are great friends. So we'll always try and go away somewhere. So we, we've got somewhere, something booked for the start of July. The chances, that's in England, the chances are it might not happen. But I'm not even worried about it getting, you know, if it gets cancelled, it gets cancelled. But, you know, the, the moment will be, you know, the best moment will be whenever we get that rebooked and whenever we, we go away and the nine of us are together, you know, playing board games, um, laughing at how useless the granddads are when it comes to the quizzes. Uh, I'm definitely going to share this uh, story with them just for that moment. Um, you know, but that, that but that's the kind of thing that, you know, we, we love to do as a family and, and, and that's, you know, that's the thing that I've missed and, and I'm looking forward to, to definitely uh, having that family time sometime soon yeah that's really nice um just finishing us off then uh, if you've got a message for people out there about the things you've learned about yourself and from the world of work and business what would it be i i think for me um it's march to your own drum right it's it's march to your own drum march to your own beat whatever you want to call it but you know i, I think the world is full of people telling uh, other business people and entrepreneurs, especially new entrepreneurs, exactly what they should do. And, um, you know, there's there's no shortage of what I would call uh, entrepreneurial false idols. You know, people who um, are, you know, they, they are telling people what to do because they it's a vested interest for them. You know, it's a vested interest. Um, 
And I've seen too many businesses, you know, fail because they've not listened to their own voice enough. They've been overly influenced by by other people and they've ended up getting confused. They've ended up getting kind of lost. Uh, and, and do you know what? Early stages of, the, of this business, I, I was the same. You know, I, I was being, you know, I was involved with some marketing people who very influential, you know, you know, selling, uh, you know, New York, New York Times bestselling authors and global, international, interplanetary speakers, um, and and all and all these kind of things. And I and I did for a moment, a brief moment in my life, allow myself to be overly influenced by what other people were saying and doing uh, and recommending. And I think you know, I think we've got to um, listen to other people. You know, so you know, it's a big theme of mine. You know, it's listening. But we've got to apply our own filters, and we've got to to kind of listen to our own uh, our own selves, and we've got to kind of follow sometimes our own instincts, uh, and and make decisions not to impress anybody else, or, or not to uh, you know not to please somebody else, but actually to to make sure that you know most people when they start their own business, it's because they want to you know have that sensation of having ownership and a bit of freedom and, and the ability to make decisions. One of the hardest things in business is making decisions. You know, you're making little decisions and sometimes massive decisions every single day. Uh, and I think that's where, what I mean. Sometimes when we're in that state of trying to make a decision, we, we are overly influenced by other people and we do overly, overly take on their word and their, their advice. I've seen businesses fail because they've followed other people's advice. I, I've seen businesses that had a chance of being really, really successful, uh, you know, not being able to realise their dreams because they have, you know, they backed the wrong horse. Basically, they've they've, they've taken a, a you know a, a single strategy and decided that that single marketing strategy is the thing that they are going to do, and that's what they're going to build their business on, and uh, and and you know it hasn't worked. So. So for me, yeah, my, 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 the biggest lesson I've learned, and it's a lesson that I've learned for myself. So I'm not saying that I'm not, I'm not, I've made the mistakes. I have made the mistakes of being overly, uh, you know, listening to other people too much and, and looking to other people for answers. You know, most of the time the answer's in, in here. You kind of know it. Um, it just sometimes takes a bit of courage and bottle uh, to say, you know what, this is, this is what I'm doing. And, and I, and I, I certainly feel that I, I, my, my business journey has been like this. I've, I've had so many, what I would call false dawns and, um, you know, searching for the, the, the kind of yellow brick road, you know, that's, that's the path. And what I've realized now is that, you know, that there is no path, there is no route, you know, you've got to adapt, you've got to, you know, be agile, you've got to be flexible. Um, and the biggest thing is you've got to, you've got to enjoy it. You know, you've got to, you've got to enjoy it. And, you know, my, my biggest thing right now is business decisions that I make are around what's what's best for my for my happiness, uh, what's what's best to help me manage my anxiety. Um, because I know I know if I'm happy and and worry free that I'm the best dad, the best husband, uh, and the best small small business owner that I uh, can possibly be. <laughs> small but perfectly formed. That's what they <laughs> say, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I don't know about that. The, old, the only thing, the only thing that, that I am, you know, the benefit of Zoom calls is that no one can really see how much of a short arse I really am. So, uh, you know, when I meet some of these people for the first time in person, they're going to be, wow, you, you looked much bigger on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I knew we would have a laugh. I knew I would enjoy <laughs> listening to your story. So massive thank you from me for coming on and, and kind of um, being a really good sport and answering some of those questions and just telling your story. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, so did I, Alison. I really, really enjoyed it. As I said, you know, one of the things I enjoy about what I do is having, you know, conversations. And uh, this has been a really good one. So thank you very much. So just to finish off, how do people find out how to get in touch with you? How, where do they find you? Um, they'll find me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, they can find, and very rarely on Twitter, but it's at Kev Anderson. Um, but, you know, the, the best thing to do is if anyone's got any questions, uh, things that they would like some advice on, then it's just ping me an email, kevin at thestoryedge.co.uk. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm always happy to you know, give anybody any advice or guidance that might help them tell their own stories as well.
Brilliant. Thank you so much. Very proud to have you as a chamber member and to have you on talking to us today. So thank you so much. Um, You're very welcome. Um, we will be sharing this story on our website and also on our YouTube channel as well. So catch up with you all at another time.